I'm Jessica Borges, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am a mid-30s woman with coppery brown hair. It's actually cut. I cut it. Um, so it's about shoulder, a little bit lower than shoulder length. I'm wearing a black shirt with bright, colorful prints on it with a black overlay jacket thingy, and I am zooming to you from my house in Michigan. Today, I am reading a sermon called Subway Jesus by Reverend Karen Anderson, who is the interim minister at the UU Fellowship of Vero Beach, Florida. I'll start with an excerpt from Reverend Anderson's poem, The Subway Jesus. The A trains for me as it rattles and rolls uptown. I get bumped, drop my book, look down and swear, Jesus, sit up. Two eyes of watery, reflective brown turn and stare into mine. What? He replies. There he was. Sweet Jesus. There he was. Sweet Jesus. Jesus on the soulful A train uptown. His face calm and dark. Sweet Jesus was no white man. Jesus, my man, was black, a man of patience and love, with soulful, piercing eyes staring into mine. Sweet Jesus, I whisper. What? He replies. I stumble for appropriate words. Jesus, the prophet of the ages, is on the train looking and listening to the ways of our age. He seems amiss and somewhat distraught. He watches and sways, bouncing and nodding in time to the train. What happened, he said. What? What happened? To what? To what, I wonder? I wonder what happened, he said, to my message. To my message of love and of giving. To my message of forgiving and learning. Did I say all this? What has become of my message? I did not say the kingdom was far. I said the kingdom was here, within. Not in some heaven in the sweet by and by. What happened, he said. His eyes searched the car for answers. None came. You know, they said I would come back. I did, you see. I saw. Sweet Jesus was the man on the A train uptown. What happened? Don't know, I reply. Been confused myself, sweet Jesus, I reply. Why? Why? Lots said, I reply. So I've learned, he replied. Work for justice, he whispers. Work, and you shall find the kingdom within. Work and be righteous and in peace. Work and you shall find me. Be fair, be love, be kind. Work and you shall find the kingdom within. A train, uptown. My stop, pause. Gotta go, gotta go, I'm late. A date, doors open, he smiles. Work for justice, he whispers once again. Tell your message, I reply. Doors close, grab my pack on my back. Sweet Jesus is a black man on the A train uptown. And now for Reverend Anderson's sermon, which Laura has edited for length. I wrote this poem 25 plus years ago after taking the subway home to my apartment in the Lower East Side of Manhattan with the resonating ruminations of a recent lecture by my New Testament professor still dancing in my head. I went to a lefty Christian seminary, and this was what I was after, a fresh social justice frame of Jesus. I had grown up Unitarian Universalist, and 
Jesus wasn't mentioned much. He'd occasionally wander forth to check if his shadow appeared around UU Christmas and Easter services, but that was about it. But here's the thing. In seminary, I learned Jesus' primary guiding force was to help people find the kingdom of God found in their hearts and in this world. To really get at who Jesus represents, I should have written the poem with Jesus not just black, but differently abled, so-called illegitimate, elderly, gay, widowed, immigrant, or female, or some combination of those. For this is what the crux of his message was about. He believed the least of these is the greatest of these. He saw himself as committed to the fullness of humanity, as connected to all people, as incapable of escaping the tugs of the interdependent web. Everyone was his brother, sister, sibling, mother, and father. Everyone was part of him. When asked by a student what the most important commandment was, he said, basically, I've got to call the tie. To love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And by this, he meant every single neighbor. So yes, in seminary, I came to know the real Jesus, not the Jesus wiped clean of any edge, fault, or squirmish manners, not the white bread Jesus proclaiming to save my soul from the fiery dungeons of hell. So let me just say, my interest in Jesus, the person, grew. Then about 10 years ago, it grew even more. You see, I came across the writing of a theologian named Walter Wink in the book, The Impossible Will Take a Little While. And it got me loving Jesus all over again. So Walter Wink, his name sounds pleasant enough, doesn't it? But his scholarship was anything but pleasant. Wink wanted us to take a harder look a more honest look at Jesus and what he really was about. Wink was a biblical scholar at Auburn Seminary in New York City. He followed in the tradition of liberation theolo theologians, but mainly he investigated the various meanings of the original Greek words that have strayed from the interpretations of Jesus for centuries. Here's some of what Wink uncovered. In the Gospels and Epistles, Jesus is said to talk a lot about the world. He says, I am not of this cosmos. Cosmos is most often translated to mean the word earth. But Wink says, yes, you can interpret cosmos as a world or earth, but a more apt translation of cosmos would be the worldly system. In other words, when Jesus says, I am not of this world, he really is saying, I am not of the world's current system. Remember, Jesus' time was one in which people were segregated by power, class, privilege, stature, and wealth. For the most part, you were treated like, well, crap if you weren't part of the ruling or privileged class. If you were enslaved, a woman, a widow, a homeless person, sick, a child, a foreigner, a so-called bastard, or just, well, poor, life, not so good. Mainly because you had very few rights, status, or acknowledged personhood. So, for Jesus to proclaim to his followers, to any who would listen, hey, I'm not of the system, but of God's world, of God's system, meaning, I'm going to help all of us bring into being a new social order, one which lifts up sharing, partnership, compassion, and equality to replace the politics of ranking oppression and violence. Well, that was pretty radical. And remember, when I say Jesus' time was violent, I think it's good to keep in mind that it wasn't uncommon for the Roman armies to quell any potential uprising by marching into towns and crucifying the entire population, 
nailing them to walls and leaving them to die. There are accounts of hundreds of people dying this way by crucifixion. Thus, life was not easy when you had no stature, no power, for you were the least of these. I'm guessing it made more sense to keep your head down and hope for the best. So, here of course comes into the system a fellow like Jesus. Now, I know there are many in the Christian tradition who take those words, I am not of this world, to frame Jesus and his message as being otherworldly. But when you change cosmos to system, his message is clarified. He isn't anti-worldly or otherworldly, but anti-establishment. Wanting a new world order, one in which God's kingdom, God's system of radical sharing and compassion was lived here on earth. This is a Jesus of radical resistance to his time. He is trying to inaugurate a domination-free society. He was stirring up the oppressed to take on and overthrow that system in some very savvy ways, I must say. For instance, take the contents of this passage. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. Now, when you hear those words, turn the other cheek, it is often regarded as acquiescence to violent behavior, as encouraging a type of passivity. Just turn away. Don't fight back. But in truth, Jesus was saying the opposite, as Walter Wink so brilliantly exclaims. According to Wink, when Jesus said, if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. It's actually a pretty radical declaration because in the ancient world, you couldn't use your left hand. It was only used for unclean tasks. So a punch or an open-handed slap by a right hand would land on the left cheek of the opponent. To hit the left cheek with a fist meant you had to use your left hand, which is off limits. The only way to strike the right cheek with the right hand is a backhanded hit, which in the ancient world was only done to people who were below you, to someone you wanted to humiliate or put in their place. So you got to ask, why then does Jesus counsel those already humiliated people to turn the other cheek? Because this action robs the oppressor of the power to humiliate. It's a clever and ancient means to resist being subdued, embarrassed, put in one's place, so to speak. I love how Wink says this. You can't backhand someone's left cheek with your right hand. The person who turns the cheek is saying, in effect, try again. Your first blow failed to achieve its intended effect. I deny you the power to humiliate me. I... I'm a human being just like you. Your status does not alter that fact. You cannot demean me. You see, Wink shows us clearly that Jesus' way was to offer a creative response to fight back, to gain some dignity, even to possibly change how one's oppressor saw you in the world. This Jesus of Wink's understanding is a demanding Jesus, an edgy Jesus, not the prince of sweet, heartwarming peace variety, not the guy who tells the oppressed, just hold on and wait until the afterlife. It will all be better then. No, he is a guy who says, I am with the poor and oppressed. I am with the homeless, the least of these. Heck, I am the least of these a so-called illegitimate child born in a barn, and I am for their worth and dignity in this life. I am saying God wants God's realm to be enacted now. This is where God's realm resides, in radical sharing, in cooperation and compassion. So I'm going to show you how to fight the system. You see, 
The message is not have patience and you'll get your reward in the sky. Just turn your other cheek. It's something else. The message is join together and learn the needed techniques. And let's create our reward now. Let's resist this system together. In short, he was a mobilizer of the least of these. One might even say a man trying to help build a mass movement of the 99%. Which leads me to this rub. I want to suggest that this Jesus is not just the true Jesus of the Bible, but also our Jesus, the you, you Jesus. We are a tradition that grew out of Christianity. If you took the special spectrum of Christianity and you had the fundament fundamentalists on one end and the liberal congregationists on the other, we use, we're not just on that left end. We are the ones that fell off that left edge. And what I want us to see today is that we are actually pushed off that edge by Jesus, this Jesus of clever resistance. We didn't run away from him. It's more like we followed him off that edge. Our growth into who we became as a religion wasn't really simply about us rejecting certain Christian dogma that we disagreed with. It was also about being inspired, pulled, lured by Jesus's radical example. It wasn't just about being Christian or not. I'm not sure we can even imagine what that world of radical change would look like. That world where everyone has a dignified seat at the table. But I do know we won't have any hope of imagining it without constant reminders. Without constantly pushing ourselves to take our action and efforts to the next level. Without constantly reminding ourselves that the spectrum of currently proposed changes to the social ills that plague us don't even come close to addressing the size and scope of the problems before us. Remember when I talked earlier about Jesus pushing us over the edge? About Jesus pushing us to the left and then saying we need to jump far past it? It's what I think we need to remember most to not allow ourselves to be limited by, too mu by much too tame proposals to fix the problems of today. Instead, we need to leap into and lean into radical change and resistance. And so, like me, on that train long ago in New York City, this is what I hope echoes in your head over and over again. Work for justice, he whispers. Work and you shall find the kingdom within. Work and be righteous and in peace. Work and you shall find me. Be fair, be love, be kind. Work and you shall find the kingdom within. A train, uptown, my stop, pause, got to go, got to go, I'm late, a date, doors open, he smiles, work for justice, he whispers, radically so. May it be, amen. <laughs>